original authors of this talk and the credits. Is that correct? Is that correct? Is that correct? Is that correct? And it's going to show something out here when I hit the search report, right? Same talk, different presenters. So, we have our next speaker is Jessica Jock. She's with the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe, Environmental Division. And she will be presenting her perspective on cultural use of lake sturgeon in Akasasne in the past, present, and future. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. As you said, my name is Jessica Jock. I work for the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe's Environment Division. I see many familiar faces in the room right now. So, some of you know that already. I've worked for the tribe for 15 years. And, unfortunately, my co-workers, Audrey Bina and Lundy Goyaks, or Eric, were not able to attend. So, I last minute put together some slides because I didn't want this time slot to go empty because of their absence. And so, it's a similar talk in the sense that I'm going to try to present the same, the past, present, and future of Dio Yankalum, which is sturgeon in Gnegeha. And I'm actually going to sit down because I don't want people focusing on me as well as my nerves. But I want to be able to share some slides with some photos. And just keep in mind that I am not Onwenhume. I'm not Native American. And so, that's why I say I'm going to try to give my best interpretation from working with the Mohawks for 15 years, as well as growing up as their neighbor, to present some of this information. But I hope the take-home message that is received today is that it's a living culture. It's not a culture of the past. It's still a living culture into the future and currently. And so, with that, just to provide a little bit of background in terms of location, there was many presentations yesterday on the St. Lawrence River and the lake sturgeon populations, whether it be through the main stem, upstream of the Moses Saunders Power Dam, in the Grass River, Racket, St. Regis. Oh, no, I broke it. I'm not sure either. Anyway, so the purpose of that map was, besides just giving some geographic perspective, was to demonstrate the area of the territory. And that requires a little bit of understanding of history. And thank you. And as some may be well aware, when working with Native American tribes, whether it's in your own state or different states or even in Canada, you know, there's different interpretations of where those traditional use right areas lie. And so this map has been created in the last two years in collaboration working with DEC and EPA. And what it shows is, so it's an area of concern, but it also shows, so in yellow, we have, it's hard to see because it's small, it says St. Regis Mock Tribe. So this is in terms of the boundaries that most people recognize from the state of New York. But the 1796 treaty included a larger part of the territory. It included the Grass River. It included these parcels. And then because Akwesasne is unique in that it straddles Canada and the U.S., it also includes parcels in Quebec and Ontario. And so what this map demonstrates also are land claim areas, but we call them traditional use areas. So when looking at a resource management perspective or resource use, a lot of times there's been in history, and I'm speaking because we're in New York State today, you know, the different perspective of where that jurisdiction lies or management goals. And really, you know, again, coming back to the shared use and resource management, we've come a long way with, you know, recognizing that. And so this map took two years to create, and I think we're finally all on board, and it's a huge success for us. But so just to give, again, some background, so when I talk about Akwesasne, and then it seems weird in the sense of, well, why are there these white gaps? You have to keep in mind, too, when talking about territories, that in the 1700s when the treaties were made, it wasn't, the Mohawks and other nations didn't look at territory based on a delineated line. We're scientists. We like surveys. We like lines. We like to see things on maps. 
it was a broad brush. It was more geographic scope. It's from, from this, this set of mountains to this, this set of uh, rapids, or, or this island to that island, or based on these fishing uses here. So, so oftentimes, when looking from the Mohawk lens, you, you want to think, or other nation lens, you want to think about the resource use and why that area may have been important. And you may often find that it was important for fisheries or, or some other animal as well. So that's why I presented this here. There's Messina, that's where I live today. I grew up over here, and I've basically been um, traveling through the community my whole life. So if I was a sturgeon and you were to tag me, um, you would see that I have a high sight fidelity for, for this St. Lawrence River area. Um, and, and the St. Lawrence River area of concern I'll talk about more in the, the contaminant talk later is um, was identified because of hot spots with uh, legacy contaminants in the Great Lakes. So this map is just, I, this is actually a photo of a, of a, of a map that I took. Um, and I just wanted to point out for the, for the resource managers that are here today, so here we are with Alpazasni. Um, what I'm, I'm going to continue to discuss, but if you look, these are little blobs of other territories of the Haudenosaunee nations. So if you happen to work in some of these water bodies or, or watersheds, you know, it might be good for, for you to, to get a sense of familiarity with what nations may be in that area, because you might find, with, especially since we've been talking about lake sturgeon a lot, but with fisheries management in general, um, you know, that there might be some, some traditional territory use interests, you know, with, with coordinating with uh, whether it be research or resource management. Now I'm going to do uh, the best job I can in explaining, explaining this photo. Um, so again, looking from the past, when, when looking from, again, in a Hunwe um, perspective, it, you, you want to kind of consider the different relationships that, that have been um, Discussed and, and when you know when we're scientists, we look at the different relationships with data. But this is a, a, a picture that is to tell the story of the creation story, and this is Sky Woman. And I don't know if anybody has heard the story, the creation story from a Haudenosaunee perspective before. But I, I would think that there's many similar there's similarities, and then there's differences, and then there's always differences depending on the story color. Storytelling in uh, Native American history is, is part of the culture, part of the arts. And you know, there weren't figures, there wasn't documentation all the time. So th this picture was, um, you know, with the traditional teachings, my, my hope to, to visually demonstrate that so, and, and Tony, I see Tony in the back of the room, he can, he can cut and correct or, or add to any of the story at, at any moment. But so Sky Woman, back in the time, it was, there was no things such as land. There wasn't um, people, or rather, there was the, the sky woman. I'm sorry, there was the sky, the sky people, and it's more like on the celestial level. And she was uh, she was a pregnant woman up in the sky world. And as most pregnant women do, she had a craving for some some roots of this tree up in the sky world, and looking for some medicines and digging. And she fell through. And, and below, there was nothing but water. And the birds caught her and brought her down safely to the back of the turtle. And oftentimes, you'll hear uh, the interpretation of you know, the land or uh, North America being considered similar to the back of a turtle. And, and so she, she fell through the sky, was assisted by the birds, landed on the turtle, otter, muskrat, all your aquatic fur mammal animals assisted by diving down to get some mud or sediment from the bottom to bring up because as she fell, she had some of those roots and those plants from the sky world in her hand. So to help plant them, they, they transferred the mud from the bottom of the water to the back of the turtle. She was able to expand the back of the turtle. It now became land, and now you have the creation story of land, basically. Then there's additional stories that continue on with because she was pregnant, she gave birth. And then from the birth of her daughter, the daughter then gave birth to these twins. And the twins represent basically good and evil, in a sense. And everything that's been created on this world that we know today in the natural world came from either the good sun creating the good things, like the medicines, the plants, the fish, the food that sustains us, and then the, the 
the negative connotation of the sun, bring, bringing like things like the thorns to the rose bushes, you know, the bad things, the, um, the foods that are toxic to you, and then there's always medicines next to them that could help kill you. So, so some of these traditional teachings, you know, outline those relationship values back to the natural world, and that that was the point of this picture, and um, and, I, and I hope it, it kind of displayed that. And then that, that natural world then is um, carried on through other Haudenosaunee duty and teachings with uh, what is also called the Ahore um, Galiwadepo, which is the Thanksgiving address, and the Thanksgiving address you know, based on the, the teachings of the creation story, then outline the different duties and responsibilities of the natural world to the people and the people to the natural world. And the way that the, the greetings to the natural world is basically everybody's gathered in a room and, and as these, these greetings to the different elements of the natural world are expressed, everybody concurs. And so it's a, it's a combined consensus. And so, so it starts with the, um, you know, the, the greetings with the people and then Mother Earth, and then it starts with the waters, and then to the fish, and then it moves to the land, and then the plants, and then the medicines, and then builds its way up to you know, the thunders, and then ultimately Grandmother Moon, and then the Creator. So those duties and teachings creates that relationship responsibility to the fish. In this case, we're talking about fish, and this talk is specific to lake sturgeon. This is a, a picture from 1986 in the Messina Observer local newspaper. And I, I thought that it was a great photo because it demonstrates these are two men from Akwesasne. Um, one is um, oh, uh, Boots, I can't remember, it's Francis Boots, who used to be a tribal historic preservation officer in our community. And, um, and so again, it's, it's the dip, making sure those duties and responsibilities and teachings are, are shared within daily activities with, with the resource as well as sharing that with, with other communities and knowledge. Um, these fish were part of a transfer that I do believe, if I recall from the newspaper article, these fish were taken from Akwesasne and I think transferred to Black Lake to help with some of the um, sturgeon stock at, at that time prior to the egg stocking pro projects. Um, so again, a past. Um, the next few slides are photos that were shared with me from um, one of the uh, sturgeon fishermen in Akwesasne. I, you know, I, I need to get clarification on the dates of these photos, but I'm guessing this might be in the 50s um, or other. But, um, you know, from an economic perspective, too, fishing was huge in the community of Akwesasne prior to, I mean, the Seaway came, Seaway and the Moses Saunders Dam was constructed in the 50s, so you had that habitat fragmentation. There was uh, persistent organic chemicals that were introduced to the environment through the, you know, post the, the hydro dam and then throughout the 70s and, and 80s. And then there's this recognition of, of all these concerns. So but there was a flourishing fishing economy in, in the community uh, probably through the 50s and 80s. And this, um, there was an Aquasasmi Task Force on the Environment Elders um, report in 1995 that I think was conducted, it was all about interviews of the elders in the community and it was conducted I think in terms of, you know, looking at the past use for the Ontario project, how power project. And, um, and so there was some documentation, actually I've got to go back to this slide, there's documentation of, I think in that time, of people talk about different harvest rates and there's always been interest in what were the harvest rates of, um, you know, of sending some fish down to New York City of, like, I think, like, on the scale of a thousand pounds a year or something like that. And it's not near, uh, you know, for, for a fisherman, for one fisherman. So it depends on the number of fishermen within the area and at the time. You know, when you look at 150 tons versus 200 tons that are documented um, in the 1980s and 1990s in Quebec from Pierre Dumont, you know, you look at the... the the harvest for, for Akwesasne versus some of the commercial fisheries. And it's, I, I don't think it's comparable, but I mean, it's still definitely an impact to, to, the, to the resource if you've got all these other ha habitat fragmentation and, and contaminant burden loading and commercial fisheries to compete with. But it sometimes the, the perception maybe may have been skewed a little bit over history because of, you know, it was just an additional impact to the resource. But, um, it may have been one of the smaller ones in comparison. But so this is moving on to the 80s, and I like this photo just because of the socks. <laughs> so like I said, if we're gonna do some comparison of harvest rates, uh, the, the comparison that I had, like I said, was from Pierre Dumont's uh, paper. He had 
And I don't know that's way down in Quebec, so I don't know if it's within Lake St. Francis or not. But so in the 80s, and then probably in the 90s. And now this shows that generational. Um, so you have uh, this is Uncle Joe. So Vaughn is um, one of the, the gentlemen that's working in the cultural restoration program. And I just realized I didn't even explain what this whole cultural restoration program is in Akasasne. Um, but so there's three generations here that, that were out fishing that day. So again, this is that community sharing, this is that community use. It's, it's a generational teaching from uncle to father, father to son, and, and it's, um, it's, it's a little different than, I mean, I, I'm sure there's other times where there's photos where the guys are having a case of beer like Ron showed yesterday, but this is a different type of fishing. This is a family fishing. And it's, um, and it's one of the things that we're trying to preserve. And now this, this isn't sturgeon, but this is muskrat. And I included these photos because I wanted to make sure that, um, you know, back again, that, that relationship value with, with different food sus sustainability, that it's not just the sturgeon, it's the muskrat, it's the beaver, it's, it's other species. It's, um, and what I found from my workings with the, the tribe and trying to, uh, because I, I, had, I got my start working with Superfund, and so we were trying to do different studies. And I kept hearing at, at different meetings of, you know, can we eat the muskrat again? Can we eat the, the beaver? And so this is, this is a muskrat feed that, that was done by, um, one of the staff members uh, to, to just, again, community sharing as well as teachings and, and to share the teachings. But let me just go back to that for a quick second. But, um, but the questions were being asked all the time in these meetings that I was participating in at, at Superfund program management of, can we eat this? Can we eat that? Because of the, the fear of contaminants. And there wasn't any initiated study to, to kind of verify if it was safe to eat again. So, in 2010, we received the Great Lake Restoration Initiative grant to study at the, at the Environment Division for the tribe to study fur bear mammals, to study fish uh, tumors, to study um, mussels and, and avian turtles. And the reason that we wanted to have not just ownership of it, but to lead on uh, that grant funding was because we want to make sure we could incorporate the cultural use of these species as well. And in our efforts to collect fur bearer mammals is how we, we formed our bond and our relationship with the Mohawk sturgeon fishermen because most many of the sturgeon fishermen are also trappers. And my understanding back in 2010 was that you know the Mohawk sturgeon fishermen were even reluctant to come to our office, the environment division, to speak with us because you know we could potentially, as the the regulating agency for the tribe, you know, prohibit their use or, or other, and, not, and that there was still misunderstanding between the scientific and the management and then the use, and the cultural use. So, moving forward into the present, this is Mr. Roger Clinton Lajikayax, and so we've, in working with the Akwesasne Cultural Restoration Program, which was developed in response to the um, contaminants and the natural resource damage assessment as a cultural restoration program which staffs people from the Akwesasne community as masters and apprentices to have an apprenticeship program to maintain the language and the teachings, the traditional teachings, not scientific teaching, but traditional teachings, so that way it, it's not lost in the community because what was being found is that with all these different changes in the community with the environment, that the elders, the knowledge holders, were passing away, and that, that knowledge was becoming lost, and that use was becoming lost, and that if there was a use, it was just a, a few, and, and it was changing, you know, the way people were relating to the natural environment, and so the, the desire was to maintain that in the community. So then, this was also now to bring Western science into it. So they're, they're, they're receiving the teachings of traditional ecological knowledge or the, the teachings that they know from their elders and from interviews with elders. And then I and, and Tony and others from the Environment Division are, were saying, okay, well, everybody needs to understand each other. And so let's, let's do some, some scientific me measures too. So you, so you can have ownership and, and you can also understand that when there's a resource manager saying, well, you can only take so many, or maybe we should only, you know, do a slot limit at this size or whatever. But there was a, it was mutual understanding on both sides. So this 
um, was during one of the egg takes, and and this was um, I was working with the, the guys in the field when they were collecting sturgeon, and you can see there's multiple sturgeon that are in this this photo. I cropped it so you can't see the whole boat, but the sturgeons that are being released are um, are being tagged. So it's participating in some potential monitoring activity, but um, not all of them were released. But, um, but it, it gave them that sense and that learning that you know they could still harvest and participate in measurement and monitoring, and and be um, you know aware of how that measurement and monitoring is used in the future for maintaining the population of sturgeon. And and this photo is one of my favorite photos. My time is up, so I'm going to end it on this picture. Because this is my favorite photo, and uh, again, just kind of starting with the, you know, the challenges of understanding between a state and a tribe and resource management, jurisdiction, things like that. Um, well, the NIPA, New York Power Authority, was also, you know, has historically been contentious with the tribe in a sense. And this was a photo of the egg take that contributes to the stalking of research in the whole state of New York where you have Mohawk elders who are language instructors, um, the Akwesasne Freedom School, which is full immersion program, language instructor um, at the Akwesasne Cultural Restoration Program, students from the Freedom School, members from the, the apprenticeship program from the Cultural Restoration Program, Barb Tarbell, Gedenias, the program manager, Tony, and Roger Clint, DEC, have NICA, more, uh, more DEC, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, USGS, and so it was a true collaboration and relationship building from, from years that was pivotal that came together in 2015. So thank you for your time, I apologize. The last thing for the future, there's educational outreach material that's outside. Um, please help yourself to take one, ten, however many, just share. The whole box can go for, for the day, I don't need any of them back. Um, but this was a bilingual production product that uh, was collaborative efforts with our office, Akwesasne Freedom School, and then the language program to so try to just use as an educational tool, and will be used this year in schools. So, thank you.